Good morning and welcome to the New South Wales Fire and Rescue Emergency Services Academy. This week, Fire and Rescue New South Wales is showcasing our numerous capabilities that it has across the state. Today, we are joined by Senior Firefighter John Stokes from our Natural Disaster and Humanitarian section. He's going to just uh, demonstrate the USAR capability our urban search and rescue capability that we have within Fire and Rescue. It's just another example that Fire and Rescue, New South Wales firefighters, are prepared for anything at any time. I'm going to hand over to Mr Stokes now, and he's going to run through the USAR capability. John. Thank you, Scott. Um, our section within Fire and Rescue New South Wales, um, the Natural Disaster and Humanitarian section, um, as Scott mentioned, uh, manages the urban search and rescue um, capability. Urban Search and Rescue is um, a name given to something, but essentially it is a structural, major structural collapse. So when buildings collapse, uh, that is what USAR is. Uh, the truck itself, because of the equipment that it carries or the, uh, the capability, the equipment we have for that capability, lends itself to assisting with technical rescues, so higher end uh, technical rescues as well throughout New South Wales. Um, but our section as well does a lot more than just USAR. Uh, it deploys uh, teams to other um, disasters. So post cyclone, uh, post tsunami, uh, post storm within New South Wales. So storms, floods, um, bushfires. So assessing damage after those disasters. Um, and our team when we deploy it is known as the disaster assistance response team or the DART team. Um, whenever we deploy, um, we are considering the humanitarian principles as well. Um, so we're looking uh, right through from uh, the response space, right through to recovery and informing on those recoveries. Um, today, what we're going to do is concentrate on the urban search and rescue capability. As you can see behind me, we've got USAR 1, uh, which is our semi-trailer based here at uh, the Emergency Services Academy here in Sydney. Uh, we're going to go do a walkthrough and I'm going to show you some of the equipment we have for that particular capability um, and then we'll uh, show a bit of an exercise that we did last week to uh, give you a bit of an idea what Urban Search and Rescue uh, does. So as you come on board the uh, semi-trailer, uh, on the left hand side here is uh, our bench. This is where we do most of our uh, equipment servicing. Uh, we've got a range of tools here. The equipment that we have on this truck uh, relies on uh, quite a heavy service schedule. As you can see, um, the environments that we'll work in uh, obviously gives the tools uh, quite a hard time. Uh, so they need to be serviced regularly um, as well as fixed as well because they get damaged quite easily as well. Um, as we come through uh, the truck on your left hand side here, we've got our breathing apparatus. Uh, we've got our standard breathing apparatus that you would see on any other fire truck um, that we go into fires. Uh, but we've also got confined space equipment as well. Um, obviously the areas we go into are quite tight. So uh, the equipment needs to be quite slim and streamlined to be able to squeeze into those areas. We have some lighting um, so we can uh, light up under the rubble piles, um, as well as our water equipment um, for pumping water into our concrete cutting uh, equipment to keep it cool, and our low pressure hydraulic lines for running our low pressure hydraulic tools. Up here on the right hand side, uh, we have our EMT kits, our defibs, all our laser monitoring equipment. We can monitor um, the movement of structures or any uh, vehicle or anything else that we want to know if it's moving uh, down to quite a low tolerance as well. So down to 0.5 of a millimetre, uh, an alarm will go off and let us know if it's moving. Um, confined space equipment, this is our communications equipment. As you see down the bottom here, we've got a big roll of cable that can be fed into our rubble pile and underneath and through the tunnels so we can maintain communication if our radios aren't working under the rubble pile. Up the top left here we have our lighting. Uh, these are lunar lights, um, also known as balloon lights. Um, these particular lights, we've got enough lighting on here that will light up a whole football field. It's mainly area lighting um, to give us situational awareness and also make sure um, there's good lighting and it's safe for everybody in the area. Just below here we've got all our concrete cutting equipment. It's a range of equipment from low pressure hydraulic, uh, which uses volume of oil as opposed to high pressure, which is what you saw yesterday in the rescue um, scenarios. They're high pressure, um, so it uses pressure as opposed to volume. Um, things like concrete cutting chainsaws, so that's the bar length 
of uh, um, ch concrete cutting chainsaw, which is 600 mils, uh, and we can cut concrete with that um, using this chain, type of chain here. So it uses diamonds in the chain to, to wear away and cut through the concrete. Further down here, we've got petrol cutting equipment. So if we've got good ventilation, we'll use that because we don't want to use that in confined areas. Up the top right here, we've got all of our uh, roping equipment. Oh, we've got some long ropes on here, up to 200 metres. Um, we've got uh, tripods and different things like that. So if we have to go down into tight areas, we need to transport people um, horizontally. So we use things like span lines, so like a big flying fox. Um, we can use that to get the people off the rubble pile. Um, as you can see here, we've got some high capacity lifting slings to be used with uh, cranes and all that sort of thing um, to lift concrete or big steel beams or anything that we need to get off the rubble pile. Uh, we have a confined space fan which we can use to suck air out or push fresh air into our voids. Um, if we've got hazardous gases in the area, we can uh, ventilate the area to give us nice fresh air to breathe. Uh, further down on the bottom there, you'll see uh, jackhammers and things like that. So what we call our breaking equipment. Um, that's what we use to break up concrete if we need to break through. On the left hand side here is our tech search equipment. Uh, that, when we refer to tech search or technical search, um, that is our visual, so cameras, as well as audio. So we've got a, what's called a DELSA. Uh, the DELSA is uh, multiple different microphones that we lay out across the collapsed structure and that's uh, and it can, it's very sensitive, so it'll actually pick up noise underneath the concrete. So we can actually um, pinpoint where somebody is underneath. The cameras themselves, there's different sizes, um, but essentially to put that in underneath, we may use pre-existing holes in the collapsed structure, or we may have to drill through and then put the camera or the microphone through, uh, and we'll use core drills for that. Um, down the bottom right hand side here, we've got a thermal lance, ultrathermic lance. Uh, that uses um, big rods. You may have seen them on uh, Cops and Robbers movies where they cut into the safe um, and there's big sparks and everything going anywhere. That burns at a really high heat and it melts the material uh, and then allows you to cut through that. Up the top, we've got things like our wire rope ladder here. Um, that is uh, a, essentially a, a ladder that we can roll up into a nice tight pack and take it down into the tunnels with us. So if we have to climb down into a big open void, so if it's a basement level of a, of a building or something like that, we obviously can't take our big ladders off the fire truck down into that underneath the rubble. Uh, so we'll drag that in and then tie that off and then we can climb down any um, holes that are down inside there. Um, we've got things like AC hot sticks, which are uh, electric, um, they make a noise. Any time there's electricity around uh, a cable, we can actually point that at the cable and it will beep and it will tell us whether there's actually electricity going through those cables. So it keeps us safe. Um, so any time we go into an area, we take them as well as our gas detectors here, which are in these boxes. Um, and they also make beeping sounds and they tell us the different gas levels that are inside that void to try and keep us safe. We've got these uh, acro props here and power shores. Anytime there's a collapsed structure, we obviously need to make sure we're safe. So we need to support the structure itself. So if a, a pillar or a brick wall or something's been knocked out, we might put these in to hold that up whilst ever we're working in that section of the building. We will then replace them with our timber. So the timber there, which we call shoring, uh, we cut that up and we replace our acro props. So we might put these in initially to try and hold the structure up whilst we're working in that. And we'll use things like nail guns um, and wedges and things like that to all make a nice, essentially replace the wall or replace the pillar with those items. On the left hand side here, we've got some high pressure airbags. Um, we can lift up to 67 tonnes with those airbags. Um, and as we lift that stuff, as we lift with those airbags, we'll utilise the timber as well, and we call it pack as you jack. So as you lift it, we put timber underneath it. So if the airbags ever do fail, it just comes to rest on your um, timber. Further down the back here, you can see we've got our six wheel bike. Um, you can see it's got a tray on the back. This truck is obviously quite big. Um, it can't get everywhere. Uh, things like if there's a train derailment or um, tight streets in the back end of Balmain, for instance, down in Sydney. Um, the, the truck can only get so close. If we need to park the vehicle, we can then use the bike to transport the equipment into the location. 
I'm now gonna um, pass over to the video that we shot last week in the exercise, and that should give you a good indication as to um, the capability of the user. So what you're seeing here on the, uh, the beginning of the video is the uh, line and hail search. Um, line and hail search is typically done by the first responders uh, when they arrive on scene. Um, what they do is, depending on the rubble pile and the size of the structure, um, they'll put an appropriate amount of people on the rubble pile. Um, they'll locate someone. Once they've located someone, they'll point to that area. Um, once they've located a possible casualty or victim, they'll mark that with some spray paint um, called a victim marking. Um, they'll put a V with an arrow. If they're unsure of how many are there, they'll leave it at that. And then what they'll do is they'll start trying to confirm that with um, our tech search capability that we spoke about. So as you can see here, they're using a core drill. And once they drill through that, they'll then be able to put one of our tech search um, capabilities in there. So you'll see it come through in a minute as you see it pop through. Once that pops through, they can then put a camera or microphone or anything in to see if they can see anybody. Once they've confirmed the person is in the hole, they can actually then update that victim marking with, uh, if it's a live person, they'll put an L1, or if there's two people in there, they'll put an L2. Um, as they remove the people from the rubble pile going forward, they'll actually cross out the L1 um, so people know that those people have been rescued. Uh, once they've um, cut through and confirmed the person's there, they obviously then need to make access and that's when they'll choose the equipment they'll, um, they'll use to break in. Here you can see that big concrete cutting chainsaw that we spoke about. They're using the diamond uh, chain on it to cut through the concrete. Uh, that particular one there can do up to 600 mil, which is the um, thickness, like the length of two rulers. Uh, so it can go quite deep. Um, as you can see, they're using PPE here, personal protective equipment. So they've got respirators on, uh, which stops the uh, silica from the concrete dust going into their lungs, uh, as well as eye protection and hearing protection to protect their ears from the na loud, noisy equipment. Once they're in the tunnels, uh, they'll uh, crawl through. They'll use, they've got, obviously got personal lighting on their helmets, um, but they've also got that AC health stick that I showed you on, the, on USAL 1. So uh, if there's any cabling or any wires anywhere, they can make sure they're not live so they don't go and electrocute themselves accidentally. Um, they'll also carry gas detection to, um, to make sure that the voids themselves don't actually have any hazardous gases in there. And if they do, all they do is they back out and then they might start pumping air in using that confined space fan that I showed you on USO1 also. Uh, once they get into under the rubble pile, once they locate the person, they might set up other lighting in there, so they might use bigger lights uh, as opposed to using their head torches. Um, and they also can set up more communications as well. So if they've found someone and the radio stopped working, they can actually run cables in and use that confined space equipment that we spoke about also. The environment that we work in um, is sometimes really claustrophobic and tight. As you can see in this particular point here, they're actually going into a tunnel. You can see their right hand, they've also still got their gas detector and that AC hot sticker going ahead of them. They obviously don't want to have it behind them because they need to make sure they identify the hazard before they get to them. This particular scenario, they can't fit through with their head pointing down, so they have to turn their helmet on their side to try and fit through. So it is quite a tight space, and uh, if you don't like tight spaces, it's probably not the, uh, the environment you want to be in. So now they've found the, uh, the location and the, the, the void that the person's in. Um, they're now coming in, as you can see, at all points, whenever they go into a new section of the um, collapse structure, they're using the gas detector and they're using that AC hot stick or that electric detection 
equipment to make sure that they don't go in. Obviously, different areas can hold different hazards, so they don't ever stop doing those checks. As you can see, the second person's got their EMT kit, uh, so any medical requirements um, they can try and deal with. Our team also has paramedics on it from New South Wales Ambulance and New South Wales Health. Um, doctors come with the team as well, so they also come into the, uh, these tunnels with us as well and are trained to a high level with USA and they train regularly with the team. New South Wales Police also provide our canine capability, so our dogs, we have dogs that do, so that forms part of our technical search capability, so they can sniff through the rubble pile and find the person as well. As you can see here, they're now uh, unrolling what we call a sked. Um, this is a type of stretcher that actually forms, so we roll it up and the person goes inside and it wraps around the person, so they're nice and streamlined. As you can imagine, we can't just take them out in a nice open door, they go back through the tunnels that the team came in through. So you saw before how tight that tunnel was, so they have to go back out through that tight tunnel. So we need to try and keep them nice and streamlined and nice and small, as small as possible, to go through those tunnels. They'll wrap that up around the outside of them and that's a thick, heavy duty plastic. So they'll be able to slide that along the floor uh, and they won't have to carry it the whole way. They're using their team lifting. As you can see, they pass hand over hand. They don't try and climb with the person and try and carry them out. They do hand over hand until they get onto nice flat ground and then they'll walk the person to the entrance to that, back to take them back out of the tunnel. It's a coordinated effort. There's always communication and the person at the head of the stretcher is the person that makes the call as to when they're gonna move and when they're gonna lift. So it's nice and controlled, nice and um, no rushing. And as you'll see, they'll pass the head out through first and they'll always stay in constant communication with the casualty, make sure they're okay. And they've that big long strap at the top to pull and then they'll push them off into the tunnel and then they're heading out into the, uh, back out into the tunnels. Thanks, John, for that really descriptive uh, description of what fire and rescue can do with our urban search and rescue capability. It still amazes me every day that we can cut concrete uh, with a chainsaw. Uh, so, John, we've had a few questions come in via our different social media channels. Yep. Are you happy to answer a few of the questions? Yeah, no worries. Okay. First question is, how fast does the motorbike go? Uh, the bike does have the capacity to go really quick. Uh, we very rarely go very quick on it because depending on the environment we're going into, or the pen, that, that usually dictates how fast we can go. Uh, normally, it's either a bush track or a, um, it might be a railway corridor. So if there's a train derailment or something, we can't actually go too fast over going over train lines and things like that. So we don't very, usually go very fast on it. Um, whenever we do it, uh, whenever we do ride it, it's uh, done in a safe and considered manner. Uh, we always wear our helmets and our personal protective equipment. Yep. And everybody, aren't the only people that can actually uh, ride that bike are the ones that have actually done a proper training course to actually ride it. Excellent. So. Safety of the community and firefighters is our number one priority within yep. fire and rescue. Yep. So that's great to see you don't take all necessary measures to make sure you're safe when working with this heavy equipment. Yep. Uh, the second question we got was, how thick of the concrete, how thick concrete can we actually cut with the uh, equipment you have on the truck? Okay, so as you saw before with that chainsaw, um, the length of that bar is 600 mils. Very rare that we actually cut that in one pass, but we have the capacity to do it in one pass. Um, usually it's around uh, 200 mils is the thickness that we usually train with, yeah. um, but we do do the odd uh, really thick cut just so we've got the, um, the capability and the training to do that. Yeah. We can actually go bigger than that because we can actually channel it out and cut some out and then recut again. So we actually, it's really uh, limitless and we can use breakers to chip out and things like that. So we can actually go thick, but in one pass, it's usually 600 mils. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah truly amazing. Uh, question, uh, where overseas has the uh, USAR team uh, deployed? So we've, uh, in 2011, we've deployed to Christchurch in the Japan. So Christchurch for the earthquake yep. and uh, Japan for the tsunami. Yep. Uh, they were close, quite close together. Um, we went to Samoa, uh, Tonga, Vanuatu. So they're the post cyclone response. Uh, we've been to Solomon Islands for things like, uh, like there was a, a oil tanker that ran aground. Yep. Uh, Greece, post bushfire. I remember that, yep. Um, and as you can see, it's not just earthquakes, it's tsunamis, it's bushfires, it's general recoveries and things like that. Indonesia after the earthquake as well. 
Excellent. Uh, where does a truck go within New South? Uh, where can this truck actually travel to? Okay, so the truck itself is obviously based in the Sydney metro area. Uh, so primarily it goes mainly uh, within that metro area. That being said, it is a New South Wales resource. So it does go to Newcastle, Wollongong uh, and regional if required. So um, there is uh, a level of USAR capacity out in the field. So um, all firefighters are trained as first responders. So doing that line and hail search and things like that and trying to make an informed decision if, if it's actually required as well is, um, is has, there's a capacity out there for firefighters in those regional areas and all over New South Wales to make those decisions. Yep. And if it's required, it'll go there as well as interstate as well. Um, yep. Those reciprocal arrangements with the other states uh, exist. So. Yeah. One more question. I could probably help you answer this one. It was, um, how long does it take for a firefighter to become a, a part of this unit? And I know it's part of the merit-based selection process, yep. and you have to be a permanent member of the Fire and Rescue in New South Wales, yep. a permanent firefighter. Uh, QF rank and above can apply once the position is advertised, but it is pretty limitless to become a member of your unit as such. Mm -hmm. But every rescue operator within, uh, every permanent firefighter within Rescue New South Wales, yep. Uh, who is a rescue operator has the ability to be trained up to a USAR category two level. That's yes, correct. correct. So um, it, the the usual um, process behind that is you have to be rescue or hazmat yep. um, because when we go overseas, we need to take those skill sets overseas. Usually, um, to get those skill sets, you're usually looking at about three four or five years in the job until you can apply for the expression of interest and once you've done that then it's done on a uh, requirement operational requirement of the the zones and areas within new south wales so an informed decision is made by uh, area commanders and zone commanders yep. to say well we need more cat 2 operators in these locations yep. to keep a good spread of um, qualifications throughout the state so it's just basically keeping the, the keeping the capability yeah. up for the people Correct. of new south wales the course itself is a month long as well so yep. it's um here at the esa and they'll, they'll spend a month going through all of the skills. So they're quite highly trained before they come here as rescue yep. operators and uh, con uh, competent rescue operators. Yeah. They come in, that's the skill level that we expect when they come in, and we then take them past that into the specifics of this extra equipment. Yeah, great. So, so yeah, it's quite intense training, one month, yeah, full time. Yeah, and it finishes with a 48 hour exercise at the end. So 48 hours straight on the rubble pile, day, night, all through, wet, cold. Rain, yeah, rain shine. hail shine. So. Magnificent. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much, John, for your time today. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to continue on with our uh, capabilities demonstrations. Tomorrow, we have our ARPAS uh, representatives coming in, our remote piloted aircraft system. Uh, please ensure that you follow us on all social media accounts. Tell your friends. This is only day two of three fantastic days to come. Thank you very much for joining us at Fire and Rescue New South Wales Emergency Services Academy. I'm Scott Dodson, and I'll see you tomorrow.